viewers please note we are changing our trade names in di tv to sly media tv enjoy your viewing Your views and comments are welcome on the program. Remember to like our Facebook page and our YouTube channel and be the first to see as it happens. Watching TV on the go. Sly and Mitchell TV. Build in bridges. For coming to this important uh, occasion, I wish to welcome you all to this edition of this police dialogue on Gukura Hundi. I think discussions on Gukura Hundi have been with us for quite some time now. And it is important to acknowledge that many people have attempted to deal with the topic, but there are people who want us to forget, who do not want us to deal with it. But uh, thanks to everyone who has uh, attempted to continue this dialogue, starting with uh, people like Elena here, we, who refused to be silenced and continue to break the silence when people would rather have, have us uh, forgotten that event. Dialogue is an important avenue for pursuing truth-based reconciliation and achieving post-conflict justice. This particular dialogue comes within the context when our country is seeking to deal with its ugly past. And today, to facilitate this dialogue on Gukura Hunde atrocities, we have an able panel. Before us today is Elena Sisulu, on my immediate left, in case some of you do not know her, on my right is Siposan Malunga. On my extreme left is Professor Martin Rupia. And on my extreme right is Dr. Dumiso Dabengwa. I am Alec Mchade Hama. I will be chairing this uh, dialogue series for today. And I will be doing more introductions in detail as each speaker comes. So without wasting much of your time, let us get into it. And I want to invite my first speaker, Elena Sisolo. She's an author and academic. She's taken part in the production of an important report. That is the Breaking the Silence report. <coughs> she will open the discussion and set us in an engaging conversation. I wish to thank you and over to you, Elena. Thanks very much. To, to, to speak on the mic. Okay, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here today. And it's quite an experience to see old friends from way back in the days when I was a human rights activist nice to see old friends from crisis, uh, my old colleagues and my former um, partners in crime as Tony Rila and I like to say. Um, it's also an interesting moment uh, both here in Zimbabwe and in my adopted country South Africa and the human rights challenges of human rights and constitutionality uh, which affect both countries but uh, in different ways. Um, I first of all want to just make a disclaimer. <laughs> I'm, I'm not an academic. I know there are people here who are doing their PhDs and very, very impressive, acquiring very impressive academic uh, qualifications, but I, I, I don't think I would put myself in that category. Maybe I would call myself now a children's literature specialist, but uh, the issue of human rights never goes away, and um, I think as a, as a Zimbabwean-born South African, uh, I have a, at least to offer a perspective, a, a unique perspective of 
being in both societies and being able to see these issues. Of course, both countries having been affected by uh, you, uh, massive human rights vi violations and atrocities, a colonial history of brutality and dispossession, and uh, liber <coughs> a liberation movement history of uh, and strong liberation uh, dominated um, uh, governments. Um, recently, when uh, we had the unprecedented, unprecedented events here of the removal of um, former president, it's in, even strange to even <laughs> say former president <laughs> Mugabe here, um, the South Africans who always have always admired Mugabe and who we've always debated with, uh, you know, were tweeting that, you know, he will always be our hero no matter what, whatever the white press says. And so um, someone then tweeted something about Kukura Hundi. I think it's from the film. The, and, and I haven't seen this film, but apparently it's a very powerful film. And I wish it would be a film which would be shown here. Um, and maybe that's something that could be followed up to this discussions because it's quite an impact to see this. And, and I just saw that someone tweeted just a little clip, which was very powerful of a woman saying what happened to her and her family. So I forward, I, I used that, uh, forwarded that image uh, saying that uh, this is, for South Africans who still admire Mugabe, this is Kukura Hundi. And it's a thousand times worse than Marikana. And, and, your, and its survivors walk amongst you. So there was a response immediately saying uh, something about people, these people that uh, promote the story of Kukura Hundia on steroids. So I responded and said, what do you mean? And he responded and, and said, um, went questioning the details about it and um, arguing that it's the dissidents and the South Africans that were behind this and apartheid. And, and I responded and said, nevertheless, whatever the case of dissidents, uh, uh, that doesn't justify killing of 20,000 people. And then he questioned the number, and then he re referred to this report, the Breaking the Silence report. And my response was that, <laughs> which was strange, he was referring to this report to support his argument that it wasn't as bad as people say. So I said, I'm aware of the report. I actually wrote the introduction to that report. And, um, and then he disputed this number of 20,000 and said, where do you get it from the report? actually says 5,000. I didn't go further into the debate, but I, I thought about it and thought, even if one said 5,000 people, it is a thousand times as many people as Marikana. And I thought about it thinking, why is it that in South Africa, when Marikana happened, you had media you had media coverage, excuse me, Sorry. Yeah. Can you just allow me to finish? We respect your views. Sure. We'll give you time to question, to interrogate. But in the meanwhile, kindly be with us. Can we deal with her so that she finishes the presentation? I, I'm, I'm not justifying anything. You're just uh, uh, no, you are not listening. I haven't finished the point. I'm not justifying it at all. What I'm saying, and I agree as a human rights activist, killing is killing, whether it's one or 20 or 30. But when you talk about a massacre, when you talk about genocide, there is a difference. And there is a difference about how 
people classify massacres and genocides. No, and it's not justifying. It's not justifying. Sorry, excuse me for coming to this important uh, occasion. I wish to welcome you all to this edition of me. Say, say, say. Excuse me. I said we are going to give everyone a chance to intervene and to ask. No, 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 Yes, communication no, like that. Yes, communication is the truth. I'm trying to touch a few inside. This is a little bit of corruption. Yeah, okay. Yes. Thank you, Japan. Thank you. So I think this just shows how important this topic is. So let's move on. And it always it also points to a level of intolerance. So on Marikana, I, I because I had been reflecting on this that on the memorial every year on the memorial of Marikana, on the South African media, you have on the radio talk shows and every radio station you can listen across languages. People are talking about Marikana. They are talking about what happened. They are condemning what happened. They are arguing about what should have been done, what shouldn't have been done. There's government people that come trying to explain and apologize. It is a big issue. And once the last memorial, I think it was three days on the radio, that this issue of Marikana people were seized with. There is no time, people have produced artworks, there have been films, it is part of the political discourse and it's a blot on the government, the current government. So this is an issue that will also haunt uh, the president of the ANC if he becomes president of South Africa and he will struggle with it in Parliament and he will constantly be confronted with this issue. And my thought was how is it that you have this level of, and, and as a result of that uh, focus on Marikana, that intense uh, condemnation, um, the, the commentary from all sex sectors of society, the condemnation of the police, the call for charges against the people uh, who were involved, in fact the career of the police chief at the time, I mean, what happened at Marikana was partly her, uh, that is, you know, led to her downfall. So there is this consciousness that this happens, and, and, and the value of this discussion, the value of the focus, and the value of the outcry is that it would prevent something like that happening again. That the South African government knows that it cannot just mess up and go and get. Or, or the next police chief will be hesitant before letting police go and just open up arms on, 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 on uh, people and kill them in that way. So, and, 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 and Marikana has been con compared to Sharpville. People have said that, why are you doing what was done under apartheid? And you have no right to do that. And so, it is a big thing. So. Contrary to what uh, the gentleman saying, I'm not justifying Marikana. I'm pointing out that it is a good thing in South African society that you have a media that has focus and people have platforms and people have not been prevented anywhere from talking about this issue. They have not been pre prevented and it is something which all South Africans know about. And my quest, my uh, grappling with this is that why would you have things in Zimbabwe 
big human rights violations and, and massive, which have caused massive disruption to the population. Uh, like Marikana and Operation, I mean, uh, Kukurahundi, Operation Murambatina, what happened in 2008 in the uh, runoff. These are, I mean, the scale of these things are just astounding. And they happen. And the question is, why, why do they happen without, uh, or why, why is it possible that a government can cause such mayhem and can visit such uh, uh, um, abuses and brutality on people and get away with it? And why is it that, that this happens here? And how did Kukurahundi happen? And as someone who grew up from a family, from family from Matebele land, I recall the time which I've outlined in the report of this, there was no national outcry, there was no media, a big story in the media. And people were getting killed and the scale of killing was increasing and it was whispers here and there. The, the, to the, topic, the topic here is not xenophobia. I have talked about xenophobia and this is not the topic. Yeah, it's a, it's a purpose no, this, is, this is an organized thing. Can we make progress, please? The topic which we are tackling here is Bukura Wundi towards a national dialogue. No, no, when they massacre people in Marikana, we never went there. So let's try to bring a big orderly. Yes, please. Let's give a chance to. 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 Let's give I was one of those who worked day and night on this issue and worked to uh, lobby with government, to lobby with civil society and the churches to stop this. As far as I'm concerned, I have a right to speak about human rights violations. In Zimbabwe, I grew up in Zimbabwe, I grew up in Matebele land. Some of my relatives were killed in Kukuraundi. As a result, I have a right to speak. I have a right to speak. I grew up there and I know what happened. And we would hear about these things directly from our relatives. And these things are documented. So those who want to deny, those who want to deny and want to deny. How old are you? I said, uh, I thought what you were saying and doing is that, uh, excuse me. You are sounding like the highest commander. Can we have one meeting, please? Can we have one meeting? Tell us. No, you tell me. Tell us why. Can we have one meeting, please? Can we have one meeting, please? Yes, we are having one meeting. I have given you an opportunity to make a presentation. Let me give a presentation. And then we can have interventions later. Okay. So, so what what happens in is that they, they, there is denial and intimidation, and I think we are experiencing intimidation over this issue because 
we are not supposed to be allowed to speak about it. And people have been silenced for a very, very long time. And this silence is continuing. So, so the part of the problem that, that I see the difference between human rights violations in other places and the need to prevent them is a free media. It is absolutely necessary to have freedom of the media. Because if there was freedom of the media and there was open reporting, actually that scale of atrocities would have not happened. And also the, the cloudiness about it and the kind of debates and the, the, the denial. It's not possible to have denial with that scale of, um, w with in the open glare of the media. So for me, my, uh, and I'll, I'll cut my the discussion short because it's clearly difficult to talk about this. But but my my main point I think I want to make tonight is that violations, such violations, the scale of such violations are possible in an atmosphere of media suppression. And if you look at this, the, the genocides, massacres elsewhere. It's always, in, it's not possible to do these things in open glare of the media. And I think we've made one of the things, the value of social media, it has its ills, but one of the values is that you, you have people being exposed. There's cameras everywhere. People are exposed for violations, for beating up, for assault, for murder, all these things, they get captured on camera. And I think there's a value to that. And I, for me, my, my critique of the Zimbabwean civil society is that there's been a lot of focus on the constitution, but not on constitutionality. And I think at the heart of actually preventing impunity, promoting accountability, is to, to have um, a constitution, I mean to have media freedom because this is what keeps gives people voice and this is what to 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 have um, uh, media freedom helps to a large extent to prevent violations and so for 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 the value of a discussion of gukuraundi is to say how can we prevent such things from happening again and how can and 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 by doing that it's important to have the discussions of these things and to have the arguments and the counter arguments is really very important. And in, in my view, in South Africa, I think there is a struggle on human rights violations. There is a struggle on police brutality. It's a constant struggle. And human rights organizations in South Africa struggle with this. But the facts, I think it, it could have been a lot worse if we did not have media freedom in South Africa. And in fact, throughout, even the, through the, the, the xenophobia, uh, uh, um, the xenophobia outbreaks, the media and the presence of media has helped to actually prevent and has helped people to fight against this. So, for for me, there's a there's a great plea for media freedom. There's a great plea that this is is really a pillar. To, pre to preventing such violations happening. And I want to say that there has been a focus on Kukula Wundi. I wish there would be more of a discussion on Operation Muramba China. The reasons it happened, who the architects were, why it happened, but also people's responses to it. Because these things will, will repeat themselves. If we actually don't look, if we don't look at the reasons why these things happened, what is the ground on which these violations are based on? We need to, we need to actually, we, we, we need to actually see. And I'm sorry that we, we, you know, have an example of such serious, such serious, uh, all I have to 
to say to oh, all I have to say, I think I'll close. I, I think I'll close here, Chair. But all I can say is actually shame on you. 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 So what I'm going to do is to call upon the other speakers, then at the end we will intervene, ask them questions, and then we we'll proceed in that manner. Next, I'm going to call upon Sipo Malunga to make his presentation. Sipo is a human rights lawyer with extensive experience in justice and governance issues in Africa. He is currently at the helm of OSISA. He has previously worked for the United Nations program as a senior advisor in the regional program in Africa. He is a former defense attorney in the Tribunal for the Prosecution of War Crimes and Crimes Against Humanity in the East Timor. He has various other experiences, but without wasting time, let me call upon Sipo to make his presentation. Sipo. Thank you very much, uh, Alec, and uh, thank you all for making time to, to come and participate in this very important discussion. Um, this discussion comes barely two days after the President signed the National Peace and Reconciliation Commission Act. The National Peace and Reconciliation Commission Act is meant to operationalize the process of truth and reconciliation and justice in the country. So, may, may, I, may I finish, colleagues? Thank you, thank you for your enthusiasm and I appreciate it. But may I, may I please finish? <laughs> I, I really do appreciate it, genuinely. Now, colleagues, let us accept one, one fundamental thing. Our country has a legacy of violence. Our country, Zimbabwe, has a, leg has a legacy of violence. Not only does it have a legacy of violence, it has a legacy of serious and very severe political intolerance. We cannot even allow each other to speak. What is this? I am, I am, I mean, does it matter who someone is? We can't allow somebody to speak. And we think that, we think that this act that the president has signed, which is supposed to enable a process for 10 years of speaking to each other, 
of talking, of understanding what are we trying to, what are we saying about ourselves? I'm asking this question, comrades. Mm -hmm. And I'm using the word comrades deliberately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are we saying there is no point? Are we doomed as a country? I'm asking this question. It's a fundamental question. So, for me it is very simple. My father here, he is my father. Our father, no, he is my he he. he trust me, he's yes. Absolutely, absolutely. So he is a victim in many ways, but he's also a leader in our country. He is on his way out. It is left to us. Yet we cannot talk to each other. And I'm, I'm raising this fundamental question, comrades. But let me move on. Let me move on. The country, our country has a legacy of violence. Dating back way to pre-colonial times. It's not the only country. It's not the only country. It's not the only country that has violence dating back to pre-colonial times. Even the United Kingdom. But we need to own and acknowledge and confront our own history, our own. Yes, Zimbabwe. As Zimbabweans. So, so, let me speak. Allow me to speak. Allow me to speak. So, whether we are talking about the Rosary Empire, the way in which Chibata Matosi, yeah, yeah. the way in which uh, Monomutapa, the way in which they consolidated their strength. Yes. There were some measures of violence. Yes. There were some measure of cooptation. Yes. Whether it's Mzilikazi, yes. yes. whether it's Lopengula. Yes. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Yes. Whether it is whether it is Cecil John Rhodes mm. and the way in which he came into this country. Mm. There was violence. There was violence. We know that. Yes. The Rhodesian government was established through violence. Yes. That is why, may I finish, that is precisely why the likes of our father here went to the war. Because they realized that talking was not helping. But what did they resort to? They resorted to violence. They went to the war. They went to the war. They were the first people to go to the war. Because they realized that if they were asking the white minority regime nicely to respect their rights, to give them their land, to give them the right to vote. They were not being listened to. They were being thrown in jail. They were being abused. They were being beaten. So they decided it is now time to fight. And they went to the war. And they fought. And it worked. Because in 1980, we got our independence. So violence works. It has always worked. And then, once we got our independence, please may I finish? Okay. I think let's respect each other enough. Mm. When you do. Let's respect each other enough. When you do. So, in 1980, the culmination of the violence between the liberation movements and the Rhodesian government was a truce brokered in Lancaster. And this truce ushered in the possibility for black majority rule. So, the outcome of the war, the outcome of very intense and fierce violence was political power. That's what came out. But it also ushered in multi-party democracy. It ushered in multi-party democracy with PF Zapu as the opposition party. But of course, having instrumentalized violence as a political instrument, it was not long before violence was another instrument to crush PF Zapu, to destroy it, to create a one-party state. And the violence was intense. It was horrible. 
It was horrendous. It resulted in thousands of people being killed. So that there could be consolidation of power by ZANU-PF. There is absolutely no contradiction about that reality. We can shout, we can make noise, we can try to stop people talking. This happened. People were killed in their thousands. What were the circumstances? In their thousands. So, so, comrades, let me let me continue, please. I have absolutely no problem. I have absolutely no problem answering questions. Can I say this? So. 1980, 1980, 81 to 1987, so the instrumentalization of violence as a political tool continues until, until, until colleagues, 1987, until because the violence persists. Don't rewrite history. Don't rewrite history. In 1987, there were issues. It's not that people are taking power. In 1987, the parties sit down. The parties sit down in 1987. It was the abduction and kidnapping of torture. And they sign an agreement, a political power sharing agreement. And the power sharing agreement ends the violence. The unit accord whereby people were coming together in Zimbabwe, not a, not a power sharing agreement, it was people coming together. I, I am, let, let me, let me be very, let me be very honest. Let me be very honest here. Uh, Dr. Mandazo, Dr. Mandazo, Dr. Mandazo, may I say something? I was invited here to speak. Yes. So, my understanding... No, 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 no. Listen. Facts. Not, don't speak opinions. Speak facts. If you speak facts, do not speak. interdict or say anything. So just say facts. Sorry, excuse me. I'm not excuse me. I'm not interested. No, can I do, can I say this? I'm, uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask what, questions. What happened in Seke? And to seek any clarifications. So let him finish. No, but he's misleading the house. You ask him that. No, if, no, 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 if no, no, so let's move on, please. No, 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 so I will continue because I believe there's more people who are interested in hearing what I have to say than the people that are not interested in what I have to say. And I believe that, and I believe that those people will engage me about what I've said, whether it is accurate or inaccurate, when I've finished, and I'll be happy to engage them back again. Uh, so I will continue, and I will, I will consider the other interruptions as what we probably should expect in such conversation now and going forward. I hope that this is being captured so that at some point in time, the authorities who are trying to usher in an era where we can account for our past understand the complexity of dealing with this. We must accept that we are going to find detractors in our midst. We want to fix all the problems that have happened in our country. So, so at the end of the day, uh, I hope that those that are listening and are willing to engage me will engage me afterwards. So, 1987, 1987, the violence culminates in a power sharing agreement, just like 1980, and the violence stops. The violence stops totally. Um, the Zipra commanders are released. My father is released from jail as well. I lost an entire childhood. So I'm a victim. I am a victim. I saw I have relatives who died. My father is dead. You know, I, I saw it. I experienced it. I'm not even, I'm not reading about it in a book. That's why I got interested in human rights. 
So in case anybody wants biographies and CVs, we can talk about that. I'm not talking about something I read in a book. So I'll continue speaking and I'll never ever stop speaking. So 1987, there's a power sharing agreement. Dr. Joshua Nkomo becomes vice president. The violence does stop and genuinely it stops. There's peace again in the country. The commanders are released. The senior ZAPU leaders are released, they join the government, everything is okay. 89, 88, 89, there's amnesties, the dissidents stop, everything is fine. 89, 90, two boy decides, okay, I'm forming Zoom. I'm sick and tired. He'd been complaining and criticizing Mugabe for so many years. They were allies, remember, you're Secretary General of ZANU. For many years, one of the longest serving members of ZANU, one of the people who formed ZANU. So he goes, eventually he, he's kicked out of ZANU, he goes to Mutare, he sits at home. Then one day he decides, oh, no, 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 now I want to be president. <coughs> he manages to convince a few people, Kombai included. What happens? Violence starts again. Kombai is shot, almost killed. This is 1990, those elections. You remember them, those who were there. Violence returns to the country. Because when there's politics and there's contestation for power, we have to have violence. That's what we do. And then two boy realizes, eh, no, I can't achieve this. This is too big for me. He goes away quietly. And then the violence stops again. 1990. Quiet, peaceful again, 91, 92, 93. Of course, the violence comes up in other forms. When the trade unionists, Morgan Swangirai, they protest. When we students at the university, we protest. There's violence, there's police, there's tear gas. We fight running battles for weeks. But the violence is, is not as intense. 2000, MDC is formed. The violence comes back. comes back again with every successive election culminating in the West in 2008. We have to own this, colleagues. We must own it. We've allowed violence to flow in our veins, in our blood as a country. We cannot pretend it's not happening. We have to find different ways of contesting politics, of contesting power, like other people in other countries. They don't kill each other over power. Relatives killing relatives. We make many excuses. There's so many excuses we make. He's MDC. He must die. Zapu, he must die. Zoom, he must die. What the F for? We can't even listen to each other. What more when we're fighting for power? So. I, I had to, in fact, I digress. That was not really what I wanted to talk about. But I ended up talking about that instead. What did I want to talk about? When it comes to Kukraundi, because this is about Kukraundi, and I've already told you I'm a victim, but I'm not here necessarily as a victim. I'm here as a Zimbabwean who is genuinely interested in being part of a process that allows our country to heal, that provides justice for people, that enables our country to move forward from this. This is why I'm here. And I hope that I'm joined by people who share the same vision as me. I understand that there are so many conceptions and misconceptions about Kukraundi. And I believe that we all have time to understand it. We all have time to talk about it. But we are going to have to listen to each other. Most importantly, we're going to have to listen to the people who are not in this room. Which is what I wanted to talk about from the beginning. The victims. There is no process of truth or healing that can ever succeed unless it places victims at the central part of that process. So, we're all analysts. I mean, I have master's degrees in this issue in human rights. I've worked in international criminal courts. I've defended militia commanders who massacred hundreds and hundreds of people. I've done that. I've defended them. It sounds odd, right? 
how do I defend someone who commits serious violations of human rights? I have defended people like that. But I have never ever wavered from a commitment to ensuring that victims get the justice they deserve. A lot of my clients were convicted, of course. They were as guilty as hell. They committed those crimes. They told me about it. I defended them to the best of my ability. Some of them got better sentences, some of them didn't. But I put everything into defending them because they deserved a fair trial. They didn't deserve to be lynched by a mob because when, when a war is finished and the villagers come and they say, he came to my village, they killed 200 people from our village. I defended people like that. At the end of the day, it is very easy to say, okay, let's kill him. I was not going to let that happen. I wanted the truth to come out. What happened? We asked the victims, are you sure it was him? Why are you saying it was him? I knew him. I know him. So the point is that processes enable truth to come out. Only processes enable truth to come out. But those processes must be in such a way that they enable victims to speak. I'm very worried about what I've observed today. I've said I'm a victim. I'm a victim that, that, that will never ever accept to be told to shut up anyway. But I'm worried about the victims that are out there. We have thousands of victims that are afraid for their lives. Who saw their relatives being killed? Who saw their sisters, their mothers being raped? The government has decided to start a process to fix this. And I am very heartened and very happy about the commitment by the government to do this, especially because, and I'm sure the president is aware that he is one of the people who are implicated, but he signed the law. He signed the law. This should tell us something. This should tell us something about the availability of a, an opportunity and perhaps a commitment by the leaders, the political leaders, to address this issue. We need to meet them halfway. We need to meet them halfway. We need to push them. We need to challenge them. Especially because, especially because the thing that has been missing is the victim's voice. So for me, and I'll stop because there are other things I wanted to say, but I got distracted. At the end of the day, colleagues, we have to create the right conditions for the victims. We have to create the right conditions for the victims. It will not happen that this process will be genuine if the conditions are not right for the victims to speak about their pain. And at the end of the day, I am very confident because I know Zimbabweans are very forgiving. I know Zimbabweans are very resilient. We now talk about 37 years we endured under President Mugabe. We talk about it as if it was five years. So we can, we can, we are resilient. We can get past things. I think we forgive too quickly before we talk. I think we forgive, maybe we don't even forgive. That's why we keep, that's why we keep killing each other. But that needs to stop. For whatever reason, it needs to stop. Whether it is violence, I've talked about political violence, but there's other forms of violence, there's sexual violence, right? There's domestic violence, there's sexual and gender-based violence, there's violence everywhere. So there's absolutely, we have no way to avoid this discussion. And I will stop by saying thank you for those who have patiently listened to me. I, I really hope that we can engage. I can engage on any issue, on this issue or any other issue. But I think that we do have that opportunity. And thank you to my panelists. Thank you, Sis Eleanor. I have the highest respect for you. I've always had the highest respect for you. It's not going to change. Uh, I have the highest respect for my fellow panelists, Dr. Martin, uh, Rupia, uh, uh, my, my, my comrade here, Alec. We used to spar when I was a lawyer back in, in Bulawayo. When I was a young junior lawyer, he was a prosecutor before he became a bigger lawyer somewhere else. 
and then of course and then of course my 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 father here uh, nothing but nothing but respect thank you very much colleagues Uh, thank you, Sipo. I think Sipo has raised a number of important issues. Among them that we have a history of violence. And that this violence has been cyclic since time immemorial. He has also talked about uh, an important issue that these things that we do is to be victim-centered. Lastly, he indicated that there has been recently enacted an act which gives us an opportunity to engage. Another big hand for Sipo. Thank you. Let me at this juncture call upon a Professor Martin Rupia to make his presentation. Professor Rupia is an academic with the Institute of African Renaissance Studies, UNISA. He's a Kenyan. He's also. He's also an executive director of the African Police, Public Police Research Institute based in Pretoria. He supervises masters and doctoral students. Welcome to he has various experiences. Again, I have to kindly request you to listen to his presentation. You are going to be given an opportunity to engage him, ask him and clarify whatever he would have said. Thank you in advance for your cooperation, <laughs> Professor Rupia. We fight running battles for weeks, but the violence is, is not as intense. Okay, uh, first I want to thank uh, Dr. Ibo Mandaza for inviting us to make some remarks. Thank you. How was it? The, the second <laughs> point is, of course, I'm hoping as Zimbabweans we can begin to engage on what the government has done in publishing the National Peace and Reconciliation Act number two of 2018. The work that we do as African Public Policy and Research Institute is continental. So I will begin with two examples on the continent. That reflects that what is happening in Zimbabwe is not necessarily unique, but it gives us a number of important points for us to take on board. The first is the events taking place in Togo, okay, after the military coup of 1963. The OAU had to first deal with the military coup in Togo, where after the death of Ayadema in February 2005, his son then took over. The events in Togo are that the people have been on the streets protesting the nature of civil military relations between the state and society. And in the New Year's address by President you know, Farah you know, Ayadema, he began to call for national dialogue. So it's important to begin to see, 50 years after the heir, the family took, you know, took power, the president now is you know, talking about you know, um, dialogue, national dialogue. I actually have a paper which I sent to the organizers. So after my remarks, you can ask for a copy of the paper to begin to see the nature of the argument that I began to develop. <laughs> So it's important for us to, if we don't deal with the problems facing Zimbabwe today, they will continue to haunt us in the future. That is the point that we must draw from Togo. The second point is about Ethiopia. <coughs> Ethiopia, in January of 2018, suddenly released all political prisoners 
and closed down one of the major uh, prisons. The decisions why Ethiopia has done that are not very clear. But certainly the Prime Minister, Haile Mariam, has explained that he is trying to foster national reconciliation. It's important we, we take on board. Now, the decision by the Ethiopian government follows important infrastructure and economic policies that Ethiopia was undertaking, which then stopped suddenly in 2016 because the people in Oromia had not been fully consulted. They started protesting, so they stopped the plans of development. What is it that we can draw from there? We have seen a number of very positive policies adopted by the new government since November 2017. But if those policies are not grounded within a society that is integrated, recognizing the differences within that society, those policies will not benefit the bubble. One of the elements that you can draw from Ethiopia was that the government had invited foreign direct investment. There were factories in the rural areas and also industries. And the people rose up and bent down one of those factories, which was a surprise in terms of you know, how the government is trying to develop the country. And yet we have the same people disagreeing with public policy. So I think it's an important point that we must draw. But there are two points that I wish to draw uh, uh, to our attention before making some recommendations. Because we have been on this road of national peace and reconciliation before. There are processes that have failed, and I'm hoping now we can find each other to try and find a way to go forward and find you know, a positive point. And the first point to note is that Although we have the, some of the organized uh, people around Gukurahundi, there are other areas that also government must pay attention. And in my discussion with government officials, that has already been acknowledged. Okay? The, the, the issues that my colleagues were referring to, Muramba China, in May and June 2005. <laughs> Uh, well, I've not uh, looked at it, and, and of course, you know, you can also look at uh, the events around uh, uh, Marange. Of, the, I, 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 I'm coming. I am coming to that. No, I am coming to that. No, 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 no. Give me an Give me an opportunity to to complete. You can speak of this. Huh? One of the things that we not you, my granny, no. not you, Kenneth. No, one of the things in my no, no, introduction, no, I was no, introduced no, no. as a lieutenant colonel. Now, one of the things that we can learn is how South Africa approached. One of the things that we, going forward, one of the things we must do. What, what, no. The South African example looked at Let me finish. One of the important points that we must do in going forward is to take is to take into account events that go events that go in the post-colonial in the colonial era. So you do not... Cons <laughs> 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 
you do not confide yourself. All of those things must be dealt with. The, one of the things that we must going to achieve is that key recommendations.
The point I was going to make was that the point I was going to make was that the inquiry or the work by the national the point I was going to make was that very briefly, the, in, the national reconciliation must not confine itself only to the present. It must also take into account events that have been in the past. This is the, when you look at the TRC in South Africa, you will find that they looked at events from the 1960s, and that is the point I'm making. Yes, 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 I think this is uh, some of the things that we have to do with going forward. Yeah. Uh, this thing is going to be extremely difficult to do. Yeah. Yeah. Let me introduce him first. Yes. I'm now going to call upon our last speaker. Yes. Uh, to Mr. Thank you. I think he does not need any introduction. Yes. No. Yes. So let me not waste your time and call upon Dr. Nadeqa to speak. Our, our chairperson, uh, yeah. I would like to believe that I would like to believe that I've been given the floor, and I don't take very kindly to people cheering at me when I speak. I'm very disappointed. At independence in 1980, I, Comrade Michuru, and other colleagues fell under the command of General Waltz. And if General Waltz is the one who commanded the bombings that were done in those places that you have been mentioning. If Rupia was there, he was merely there as a soldier and carried out what he should have done. But in order, in order, that's why in military language we have ceasefires. And in order to correct the wrongs of yesterday, we had to sit down and be able to get this country to move, to get some of you to be born who would have not been born otherwise. 
the issue we are discussing is a very serious issue, the Gukuraundi event. I want to welcome the organizers of this dialogue for having invited me to come first as a victim and secondly as somebody representing all the ZAPU members over 20,000 of them were killed by the Gukuraundi not by the Rhodesian forces but by some of our own Zimbabwean brothers under the 5th Brigade this I hope we must all understand if we are to resolve the issue of Bukuraundi, which has not been resolved to this date. Some three years ago, I remember being grilled by a Sunday Mail young reporter who wanted to know about what actually happened. At the end of that interview, this young man was in tears and he said to me, but my father, you are going to go and leave us with this unresolved issue, this serious unresolved issue, what do you expect is going to happen to us? At that time, I say to him, well, you better appeal to the powers that be to listen to what people have to say about the issue of Kukuraundi and find a way of correcting it because if it is not corrected for generations to come the issue of Kukuraundi is going to remain a very <coughs> sad and difficult issue for the young generation that did not see exactly what happened and those in particular whose parents and relatives were victims of Kukuraund like my young man here, Sipu. In order to be able to explain the issue and find a way of resolving this issue, for the benefit of those who were not born or were too young to understand, let me very briefly recap exactly what happened. Your views and comments are welcome on the program. Remember to like our Facebook page and our YouTube channel and be the first to see as it happens. Watching TV on the go. Sly and your TV. Build them bridges. Viewers, please note we are changing our trade name ZinDITV to Sly Media TV. Enjoy your viewing.